All right, so welcome back, Elaine, to the uh, Zoom room for another worth of letting go live session. So um, let's jump straight into um, our teaching for today. So um, there's, as usual, a uh, quote that will lead us nicely into today's lesson. We'll do, and then we'll finish the session with a, uh, a meditation. Okay, so. Let me just share my screen with you. All right, so go and you can read that um, headline quote for us. Is that big enough? Yeah, zoom in a little bit. We often think we know what will make oh, us. You can read happy. the headline quote to kick it off from a doctor. Yeah. Have I, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. We often think we know what we will make will make us happy, but the science shows our minds don't always point us in the right direction. We long for fame and money, or a beach body, or a new car. We expect these things will make us happier. It's just that those expectations are. Flat out wrong. No, flat out wrong. So, um, pretty pretty clear, really. Um, this is what the research says. Uh, she is lady, Dr. Ray Santos, is a professor of psychology at Yale University in the US. Um, she produces a podcast called The Happiness Lab, which is, has had over 40 million listens to date. Um, reminds us that we cannot find authentic happiness outside ourselves. So one of the episodes on stoicism um, should particularly resonate because it shows the ancient Greek and Roman Stoics over 2,000 years ago were, were practicing very similar techniques to those Yeshua recommends in the Course of Miracles. For example, they reinterpreted seemingly negative circumstances as challenges designed to build their character and emphasize that while we have very little control over what happens to us in life, we always have control over our mental and emotional responses to whatever seems to happen to us. That was the, the stoic philosophy. That sounds very familiar, doesn't it? That's you know pretty much Course in Miracles 101. Uh, so these ideas are not new. These ideas are thousands of years old. And we're just studying a you know, modern version of it, which which has um, the metaphysics uh, explained. The thing with, with a lot of these teachings, Stoicism has truth in it, but it doesn't have the whole truth because the Stoics didn't doesn't didn't understand that the world's an illusion. But they had a you know a, a part of the truth because they understood that no matter what the circumstances were, you could always change your mind, and it was your response to the challenges of life that really mattered. Um, so, uh, you know, Stoic philosophy was like, well, you know, learn your lessons. Um, don't, don't try and, to, you know, run away from the adversity and the challenges. In fact, you, be, you the Stoics understood that the challenges deepened your understanding and they developed your character. And they were, in fact, necessary if you were going to advance as a Stoic. You needed the challenges of life. So very similar to what the Course is saying. Yeah. Modern scientific yeah. research. Um, so there's a, a podcast that you can listen to, which um, is about Epictetus, who was born into slavery. Uh, he was beaten until he was lame. So, you know, not a great start to life. So he's lame for the rest of his life. But he became one of ancient Rome's greatest thinkers by accepting every setback as an opportunity to learn and grow. 
and he was he was really uh, one of the key Stoic philosophers. Um, he's known as the founder or the father of Stoicism because he he took the adversity and he um, he accepted it as um, you know something that was helping him to learn and to grow, even you know, something as um, horrible as is being beaten to the point of being lame. Um, so modern modern scientific research supports what the Stoics and other spiritual teachers like Yeshua have taught about how to experience happiness consistently for thousands of years. So the research he's talking about would include the famous Grant study undertaken at Harvard University uh, to discover the answer to the question, what makes people consistently happy? That was the, the subject of the research. After 80 years of research, uh, costing over $20 million, um, it concluded that there are um, two primary factors that lead to happiness and lasting life satisfaction. Number one is warm, loving relationships. And number two is not pushing uh, love away. So those, are, those are the two factors that they, they found. So um, money, social status, um, the, the guys they, they followed at Harvard were – um, generally quite, you know, well off. We've gone to Harvard University, included uh, John F. Kennedy, who became uh, president of the United States uh, 20 years later, and various other high-profile doctors, lawyers, senators, and so on. Um, and the university, they found, well, you know, the, the, the warm, the strength of the warm, loving relationships in someone's life was a, a huge determinant of happiness. And the second factor was don't push love away. So, um, that's letting go, you know, let go of the tendency to want to separate and push love away um, by letting that go and, you know, instead accepting uh, love. Um, so, again, very similar to the course, you know, holy relationships are key in the course's teaching and uh, in, in letting go of forgiveness, we are um, training our minds not to push love away, but instead to accept it back into our minds. So in the modern research um, that lasting happiness isn't to be found by pursuing external pleasures or goals and that the emotional intelligence not to push love away is a critical factor in sustained happiness aligns with the conclusions of Stoic philosophers like Epictetus and uh, if you look at the East, um, Buddhism, the second noble truth, the Buddha stated two and a half thousand years ago based only on the observations of life. And so the desire... Uh, craving or attachment is the source of all suffering. Epictetus understood this as well. Accordingly, that letting go of one's attachment to these cravings ends suffering and leads to happiness. Um, that was the second noble truth the Buddha noticed, but it, it you know it's incorporated into the Stoic philosophy as well. Um, so um, her insight, Laurie Santos' insight based on modern scientific research, aligns with the second noble truth stated by the Buddha two and a half thousand years ago, based just on his own observations of human life. That desire, or is it called a tana in his native tongue, Pali, which literally means thirst, is generally translated as craving, uh, is the source of all suffering. He understood that, you know, the moment you desire, what you're really saying is, I'm not okay as I am. I want something more in order to be okay. So what that's telling your mind is you're not okay as you are, uh, which then undermines um, your your true self because uh, your true self is always okay as it is. So desire is a you know a subtle saboteur of your inner peace and the the, 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 the the truth that you are okay right now. You don't need anything else to just be happy as you are. So the ego of belief in separation must separate its desires into uh, parts. So there are three types of craving in Buddhist philosophy. Um, once you once you're in separation, then you know it, it subdivides and subdivides. So these three types are called kamatana, which is craving for sensual pleasures. So um, that's what most people think of as pleasure seeking. You want physical sensations and the things and activities that stimulate them. That might be food. Uh, sex is a common one, ingesting substances like alcohol and drugs, uh, shopping, surfing the internet, um, you know, whatever uh, whatever it is um, that uh, you, you associate with pleasure and you crave for that. 
Uh, so that's an obvious one. Then there's um, number two, which is a bit more subtle. It's bhavatana, which is is craving for. For being and you know, wanting to be something you're not already on the level of form, such as beautiful or successful, um, as spoken about in detail in the talk by Marisa Pierre that I, I posted um, uh, recently, hypnotherapist to celebrities like Princess Diana. Um, so these these people are craving for being. They they're not happy as they are. They want something else. <clears throat> if you recall, did you ever watch Forrest Gump? Yes, I did. It was very good. That film. So do you remember the scene where Jenny, his girlfriend, takes him into her dorm room? She's at, mm-hmm. she's at college. She takes yeah. him up to her dorm room and she's having a chat to him. She's saying, well, you know, Forrest, so so she, uh, he's asking her, like, well, you know, what, what are you trying to do? She says, oh, well, you know, I want to I want to I want to become a musician. I want to do this and that. <clears throat> and um, he kind of says, well, why, why, why do you want to do that? Why don't you just be Jenny? Mm-hmm. And she's she's like, you know, trying to explain it to him as though he's a simpleton. Well, you know, you want to be something like more than you are, you know, just a little bit better, an enhanced version of you. Mm-hmm. And, of course, Forrest doesn't get it. He's just like, well, I just am what I am. <laughs> mm-hmm. But it's a, you know, it's a brilliant little conversation of exactly this issue. Uh, she's craving to be something else because she's not happy as she is. She's got all of her, her trauma because you know she was abused as a child. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so she she's not okay as she is, and she's seeking the fame in order to somehow be okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and Forrest is just well, I I'm not seeking any of that. I just am what I am. I'm not yeah, I'm not seeking person. anything. Mm-hmm. I'm just doing whatever I feel called to do. You know, he's not he's not doing any of the things he does because he wants fame or fortune or some future outcome. He just plays ping pong because he enjoys ping pong. And mm. uh, <laughs> he goes yeah. running because he feels like he's, you know, going to run. We, he rescues the guys in, in Vietnam because that's what needs to be done at the moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's a very, you know, the, a, a brilliantly done movie, really, because it contrasts it's that, that kind of enlightened being fully present in the now, really simple, and how successful he is when he does that compared with her, you know, wanting the success, but actually her life's a mess. Yeah. Um, you know, she gets into drugs and and she's really not happy. Eventually she gets AIDS because of her lifestyle because the craving for being was was, was never going to make her happy. Whereas Forrest uh, Gump is just happy as he is. Like, I'm just okay as i am i just am what i am i'm just i mean what he says to us i'm just forest you know i'm just forest gum what else could i be <laughs> mm-hmm. so there's there's no there's no craving for being there um and you know what what they illustrated with jenny was exactly what uh, celebrities do many of them are damaged people she says marisa pierre's insights in this talk is that damaged people seek fame and success because they they think that's a way out of the damage of the you know the, the the dark feelings that they have that that's going to somehow help them and and they'll find salvation that way and of course when they go that path and if they succeed and then they're still not happy then what then where do they go because they've they've done what the ego asked them to do and they're still not happy in fact often they're even more miserable and then of course they turn to substances and so on because and eventually, if they if they're lucky, they'll get to someone like Marisa Pierre who can actually help them to to just claim their enoughness. All she does is say, you know, I am enough. She she gets them to say, I am enough, over and over and over again, as an affirmation to themselves in the mirror, to affirm that they are enough as they are, and they don't have to crave to be someone else. They they're okay as they are. So just applying, you know, the second noble truth of Buddhism. Uh, into those situations to um, help them to heal. And, you know, her her success uh, has been uh, uh, marked far more so than, you know, any traditional psychotherapeutic approaches, which don't go to the very core of the issue, which is their own self-concept. And she's like, well, I don't get it. Why don't these psychologists and psychotherapists who phone me up and say, how are you doing this? Why don't they just do, do what I do? 
it's not mm-hmm. rocket science. I'm not hiding it. I just, you know, I've shared it free and openly. And if they phone me, I'll tell them. Well, just just tell your clients to say I am enough over and over and over again because that's the problem. They don't feel like they're enough. And as long as you're craving to be something else, you are suffering because you're saying to yourself all the time that you're craving to be something else that you're not okay as you are. And then the final form of craving is vibhavatana, which is craving for non-existence. So that's <laughs> craving to not experience unpleasant things in your current or future life. Yeah. So you don't want unpleasant people. You don't want challenging situations. You go, no, I just I just don't want this. And the more I don't want it, we call it aversion in English, or devesha in, in Pali. The more I don't want it, the more I resist it, in other words, the more it persists. Have you noticed that? Yes. Yeah, no, I'm a bit... I'm You're a bit putting all your that. energy on what you don't want. Well, that just yeah. sets up resistance, uh, ongoing resistance, and then it just keeps coming. It's true. And yeah, it keeps no, showing no. up. And you go, like, but I really don't want it. No, and it keeps showing up. Well, well you know, why is that? Because you've got to let true. go of this form of, a, of, of craving, which is aversion, which is a, a cunning one, because it doesn't seem to be craving, but it is. Because you're yeah, craving, desiring for something not yeah. to be the way it is. But when you argue with reality like that, you're always going to lose, aren't you? Oh, this shouldn't be the way it is, but hang on, it is the way it is. Yeah. So now I've set up a situation where I can't be happy because it should be another way than what it is. And I keep resisting that. And, and the ego loves that because in that resistance, you, your separate self-concept is strengthened and all the, the negative thoughts and emotions that it feeds off are strengthened. So these forms of craving or desire uh, are not helpful and they cause us a lot of suffering and uh, we just got to you know be able to see that to to let them go yeah so the alternative to the ego's obsession with seeking for satisfaction in the external world it invented in these dysfunctional ways these these three forms of, of craving uh, that we just uh, talked about and never finding it because remember it's it's uh, mantra is seek and do not find. As Yesha phrases it so well in A Course in Miracles. Seek and do not find the answer. So you will look and you will look and you will crave and you will crave and you will never find the answer. There's a, a Greek myth of a um, uh, Narcissus who um, was punished by the gods to... Um, to stay because narcissus was was narcissistic so it was dealing with the, the narcissistic self-concept would stare for hours in the pool um just looking at himself and um and then i think you know angered one of the gods because he said i'm i'm uh, more beautiful than you and so the god the gods punished him by um forever forever um condemning him to craving he had to uh stay stay forever in the pool and uh when he was he was hungry there was some grapes just above the pool he would reach up to get them and then they would just go out of reach so he couldn't get there and when he was thirsty he would reach down to try and drink and the the water would drop Uh, and so the you know that myth is there to um, to teach us that this um not not narcissism is the the false self-concept it's all just about me and me, dooms us to eternal suffering because we're just craving, um, seeking and not finding. And we'll never find um, any kind of true happiness or satisfaction in that craving, as you know, today's quote um, indicates. So the alternative to this is to connect with and accept that you are love itself. Right? You are whole, you're complete, you're perfect as you are right now. There's nothing to crave, there's nothing to desire. There's nothing to avoid. You know, I am that I am. That's the, the first uh, name of, of God in the Bible. It was given to Moses in his burning bush experience. He said, you know, who are you? Who, who, who's telling me to go and save my people in Israel? And uh, he's saying, uh, the, 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 the presence just says, I am that I am. Which is the eternal source of all happens. So, um This will um, this this 
presence will make you indescribably happy when when felt at its strongest intensity, which is sometimes called bliss or ecstasy. But even when you're busy thinking and doing, being connected to your source will create an underlying feeling of contentment and peace that can be called happiness or flow. And this is why we do the mind training, to stay connected to our source instead of craving. We are okay as we are right now. That's that's the practice. And if we can learn to be consistently happy in every situation we experience, that's full transfer of training. Because we are, we are connected to our source all the time. We never disconnect. We never allow the ego to come in and cause unhappiness. Um, then the training has been successful, hasn't it? And, and we've applied the mm -hmm. training to every aspect of our life. Yeah. And that's you know that's what we're trying to do with this mind training. So that we become progressively, consistently happier, more flowing, uh, more loving in every aspect of our lives. Mm. It's very simple conceptually, but to actually do it, it full transfer of training means oh, yes. that there's no space for the ego. You know, this applies to every situation, every relationship, every circumstance, every event, every encounter mm. with anyone. This 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 happiness goes with you. God goes with me wherever I go. That's one of our lessons today, because God is in my mind. Mm. Or pure formless awareness of perfect love goes with me wherever I go because it's in my mind. And if you can re re recognize it, realize that, and remember that all the time, then that's full transfer of training. And that's that's you know what we, we're training our mind to do with these mind training exercises. So we become very, very consistent in applying uh, these teachings. And we don't make exceptions because there are no exceptions. Exceptions are, are only made by your your ego's desire to to maintain its its own existence. Then it, it wants you to make an exception to the truth, to maintain its separate existence. Does that make sense? It does. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that brings us to um, today's lesson. Uh, we're just going to have time to look at. Um, the lesson today, which is uh, another review lesson, 56. Oh, um, Risen. Yeah, maybe we can just talk briefly about that. Mm -hmm. Did you did you watch it? I didn't know what happened to you. Have you, have you never watched it? Don't think I have, actually, no. No, no, no. Yeah, I definitely, definitely watch it. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah. it's another perspective on the crucifixion, resurrection, told from, from a different perspective of a Roman soldier who is tasked with finding Yeshua's body. So there's this massive body hunt because they don't want his body, uh, they, they, they want to find his body to prove that he doesn't resurrect and he's not the Christ, he's not the Messiah. Mm. Uh, and so um, a Sanhedrin, you know, get get the Romans to go. You know, searching for the body, and this guy's in charge of the of the search. Um, and you know, it, it shows it shows how he searches. And he's he's very cynical. He's an unbeliever. He believes in the the Roman god of Mars, which is the god of war. He's a cynical skeptic. He doesn't believe in you know anything other than this material world to start with. But then <clears throat> there's a, a brilliant scene where he walks in, and he sees Yeshua with his disciples. Uh, having resurrected, you know, he's seen him a few days before dead on the cross, and then he sees him and he's like, That just blows my mind. You he drops his sword, mm -hmm. comes in, he drops his sword, and he goes, What you know, that this is just he, he can't get his head around it, and that and that completely changes him. He then he then can't carry on uh doing what he's doing, serving Rome, and, and he actually follows the disciples and becomes a ultimately becomes a disciple. So it, it shows his hero's journey from disbelieving cynic to awakening believer because of the example that Yeshua set. Look, I've overcome death itself. And he thought that's impossible. But, you know, he's, he's witnessed it with his own eyes, which just blows his mind. He can't, he can't fathom that. He just sits there and he drops his sword and he just looks in amazement. He's just like, what? 
Like this is just a total, you know, mind blow. This it shifts his entire paradigm of his of his world. It rocks his world in that one instance. So that would be called a you know moment of awakening or satori in the east, where some something happens and you just like whoa, like I just mm -hmm. his entire construct up to that point of his ego collapses because he just can't make sense of it. It's a really good movie, and then there's yeah. some commentary. <laughs> Actually, uh, David Hoffmeister did one of his um, movie gathering, online movie gatherings, where they did about three hours of, of commentary on, on the movie. So if you watch it and then you listen to the commentary, you know, that's like a, a five hour uh, mini, um, uh, mini workshop that you can do uh, yourself. Yeah. Okay. So that brings us to the uh, lesson for today which is um, another review lesson, as I said. So let's go into the lesson. Yeah, okay, so this is lesson um, 56, reviewing five uh, previous lessons, original lessons, uh, lesson 26 to 30. So let's um, dive straight into it. If you can read lesson 26, uh, the key idea and uh, the original and alternative, just alternate as we normally do. Yeah. Do one sentence in the original and one in the alternative. My attack thoughts are attacking my invulnerability. How can I know who I am when I see myself under constant attack? How can I know who I am when I perceive myself under constant attack? Pain, illness, loss, age, death seem to threaten me. Pain, illness, loss, age and death seem to threaten me. All my hopes and wishes and plans appear to be at the mercy of a world I cannot control. All my hopes, wishes and plans appear to be at the mercy of the world, I cannot control. Yet perfect security and complete fulfillment are my inheritance. Yet perfect safety and complete fulfillment are my inheritance. I have tried to give my inheritance away in exchange for the world I see. I have tried to throw my inheritance away in exchange for a world I perceive. But God has kept my inheritance safe for me. Uh, but pure form of awareness of perfect love has kept my inheritance safe for me. My own real thoughts will teach me what it is. And the same, my own real thoughts will teach me what it is. Okay, and from the top in the um, in the alternative, kindly. <laughs> yeah, my attack thoughts are attacking my invulnerability. How can I know who I am when I perceive myself as under constant attack? Pain, illness, loss, age and death seem to threaten me. All my hopes, wishes and plans appear to be in the mercy of a world. I cannot control, yet perfect safety and complete fulfillment are my inheritance. I have tried to throw my inheritance away in exchange for the world I perceive, but pure formless awareness of perfect love has kept my inheritance safe for me. My own real thoughts will teach me what it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on that? Uh, well, while we're in this thought system of the separate self, then we're going to be in under constant attack of pain and illness and loss and age and death. That's all going to constantly threaten us. And we're going to be at the mercy of the world that we can't control. So to be in our 
perfect safety and, and where our inheritance is, we need to exchange it for a pure fullness awareness, a perfect love. And it's there for us safe. So our own real thoughts will teach us what it is. Mm. It's a massive lesson. Huge, mm. huge um, lesson in the lesson. course is my own attack thoughts are yeah. attacking me. They're attacking my invulnerability. My attack thoughts are attacking my own invulnerability, which is my true self, which is by definition invulnerable. It's immortal. It's eternal. It cannot be threatened. It cannot be harmed. It cannot suffer. It cannot die. As soon as I have an attack thought, I attack that invulnerability. The ego tells us attack thoughts get rid of guilt and they keep us safe. But actually, the moment we attack anyone, we're attacking our own sense of being an invulnerable self. Because if we can attack someone else, so we believe that we can be attacked. So attack and attack promotes fear. Fear is a... Uh, intimately connected to guilt and so the whole system gets reinforced we look at this diagram you see that mm. so you want you want to attack as a projection of the guilt that you feel for the imagined sin of destroying perfect love and you say well someone else is going to be guilty and someone else will be destroyed by god so i'm going to project my guilt onto them and i'm going to attack them in the form of physically attacking, or it can just be an accusation, you know, blame. And 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 we see that all the time. I mean, I don't read the uh, newspapers very often, but whenever you do or you listen to the news, there's inevitably someone accusing someone of something, isn't it? You hear it quite often. Oh, yeah, oh yeah. you know, this minister's accused some so and so. So of doing so and so, and this this is common. You'll you'll, you'll hear it. And accusation, blame, and attack. Uh, so that that confirms attack confirms that um, you must be guilty. That confirms that fear is real. And the more you attack, the more you invite attack on you. So your fear gets gets uh, confirmed and enhanced um, and uh, strengthened. And and the guilt that underlies it is is uh, confirmed. And then you've just got to do the same thing. The ego's answer is, well, just project your guilt out some more and attack some more, and that's going to keep you safe. And yes, you're saying, no, that is attacking your own invulnerable self that um, is beyond all this, that's immortal and eternal. And every time you do that and you reinforce the thought system of guilt and fear and attack, you're attacking yourself. So it's not a smart thing to do because you can't ever find happiness and peace if you keep attacking your own true self. That would seem to be completely logical. But of course, the ego, <clears throat> the ego's logic denies it. And uh, the ego has its own twisted logic. And this is why you should say, well, you're not going to reconcile these thought systems. If you believe in the logic of the ego, then you will attack yourself and you have to deny the spirit and uh, the Holy Spirit sort system. And if you deny the logic of the ego, then you have to accept the logic of the Holy Spirit. It's one or the other, but you can't do both. Okay. So happy to go to number uh, 27, number two, which is summary yeah. of um, 27, lesson 27, and in the original and alternative. Yeah. Uh, above all else, I want to see. Above, uh, above all else, I want to perceive truly. And uh, recognizing that what I see, stroke perceive, reflects what I think I am. I realize that vision is my greatest need. Recognizing mm -hmm. that what I perceive reflects what I think I am. I realize that the true perception is my greatest need. The world I see, perceive, attests to the fearful nature 
of the self-image I have made. The world I perceive attempts to the fearful nature of the self-image I have made. If I would remember who I am, it is essential that I let this image of myself go. If I want to remember who I am, it's essential that I let this image of myself go. As it is re replaced by truth, vision will surely be given me. As it is replaced by truth, true perception will surely be given to me. And with this vision, I will look upon the world and on myself with charity and love. I will perceive the world and myself with unconditional love. And above all else, I want to perceive truly, recognizing that what I perceive reflects what I think I am. I realize that the true perception is my greatest need. The world I perceive attests to the fearful nature of the self-image I have made. I want to remember who I am. It is essential that I let this image of myself go as it is replaced by truth. True perception will surely be given to me and with this vision, I will perceive the world and myself with unconditional love. Mm. So what's he saying in this one? Well, we want, he's trying to say that, you know, above all us, we want to see truly. Have you got the, you've, I've lost the, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, I'm just going to bring it up in another program because I just want to fix something. Mm -hmm. Okay, there we go. Okay, so there it is. Yeah, so what's he saying? So when we recognize what we perceive reflects what we think we are. Um, so the world that we see outside of us is a fearful nature of, of this self-image in us that we have made. So if we remember who we are, then we can let this image of ourselves go and replace it with the truth and vision. Yeah. So we will change our mind to the uh, thoughts of charity and love. Or unconditional love. Hmm. I like this one. I mean, it, it, it echoes what what um, in in the last one we had. You know, above all else, I'm determined to see. Above all else, I want to see. Um, this one just adds in above all else. Right? We had a I'm determined to see, and then I'm determined to see things differently, and now above all else. Mm -hmm. It's quite a commitment, really. This is uh, above all else. I like any other goal desire, expectation, dream. Above all else, I just want to perceive truly every situation. That's that's what this is saying. So above all else, I'm committed to true perception because true perception must come from my true self. So above all else, I'm committed to perceiving with my true self. That means that I identify more and more with my true self and I come to know myself. So when you say above all else, I want to perceive truly, you're saying above all else, I want to know myself. And I come to know myself by perceiving things correctly. Which is always with unconditional love. It means no judgment, just, just perceiving that every one is the Christ, even if they don't know it. They still are the same self as you. They still are pure, formless awareness of perfect love. 
even if they've forgotten it. But you can remember it for them. So you don't have to believe in what they believe. As soon as you do this, you, you correct your perception. That's all it takes. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm perceiving with, with um, unconditional love and I'm letting go of my, my judgments and my attack thoughts and my fear and my anger and my hatred. So again, very, very simple what he's saying, but it's a, it's a massive commitment. Above all else, I want to perceive truly. That's what my life is for, to, to, to perceive truly. This is where the rubber meets the road of this thought system. Mm. Is in your perception. That's why he focuses on perception rather than on, on revelation, because revelation takes you beyond this world. But um, yeah, you must correct your perception in order to become ready for revelation. There's no way you're going to find revelation if you're still perceiving from yeah. an egoic perspective with, with fear yeah. and guilt and sin and anger and hatred and judgment and um, yeah. that its consequences um, very much in your awareness. You, you can't, re revelation is, is far away from yeah. you. So the route is to correct perception first. And as you correct the perception, you become more and more ready for the uh, the revelation. Shown here. So he's asking us to correct our perception of all of our experiences in time and space. True perception from a true self, which means we must let go of the separate self's interpretation that identifies us more and more with the true self. And um, we, we find more, more love, more peace, more joy. And, and that brings us in more and more into alignment with this pure formless awareness of perfect love. We start experiencing more and more of this awareness, the more we perceive correctly. And so it opens the, it opens the door for us to ultimately experience just this awareness. And just merge, you know, the, the course is God takes the final step. That means we merge back into this awareness and we become one with this awareness and there's nothing else but this awareness in our in our awareness. But the, the preparation for that ultimate, you know, merging of the father with the son is, is the, the, the correction of um, of our of our errors, correction of our mistakes. So we must we must perceive correctly. Okay, and then, and that's yeah. what this, mm -hmm. this this is all about. It's just saying you know perceive whatever um, whatever um, happens above all else, right? Above any other desire, goal, dream, expectation. I want to perceive truly, and then reaffirms it in number twenty eight. Same same idea, but just I'm going to perceive differently. Mm -hmm. So he's emphasizing, and, and if you remember, he had two previous versions of I am determined to see, and then I'm determined to see things differently. Mm. It's the same, same lesson, effectively. So he's done that four times to, to really you know, emphasize it you know, over and over. But you've got to really want to do this above all else. Okay? Mm -hmm. So if you can read that. Above all else, I want to see differently. Is there any way we can have it on the full screen rather than part? It's only just a part. It's not sure on the I can, yeah. I just went there because I wanted to uh, edit oh, something. Oh, I see. Oh. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, above all else, I want to see differently. Yeah, above all else, I want to see differently. The world I see holds my fearful self-image in place and guarantees its continuance. The world I perceive holds my fearful self-image in its place and guarantees its continuance. I've got all tongue twisted there. Continuance. 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 Yeah. Continuance. yeah. 
While I see the world as I see it now, truth cannot enter my awareness. While I perceive the world as I perceive it now, truth cannot enter my awareness. I would let the door behind this world be opened for me, that I may look past it to the world that reflects the love of God. Uh, uh, I choose to let the door open behind the world be open to me so that I may look past it to the world that reflects pure formless awareness of perfect love. Right, and above all else, I want to perceive differently. The world I perceive holds my fearful self image in place and guarantees its continuance. continuance. While I perceive the world, as I perceive it now, truth cannot enter my awareness. I choose to let the door behind the world be open for me so that I may look past it to the world that reflects pure forms of awareness of perfect love. So that's the world you know, cleaned. It's a world, a world that is cleaned in your mind and your perception of all of the guilt and the fear, the attack thoughts, the hatred, the anger, you just don't perceive that anymore. This is what Yeshua calls the real world. The world beyond delusion. The world that, 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 that is a reflection of this pure formless awareness of perfect love. So the light of this awareness uh, informs your perception of the real world. And and the, the, the darkness, the limited awareness of the ego is gone. So you simply overlook all of the negativity and the darkness of this world because you recognize that it's not true. If it's not true, then overlooking is the only thing you can do and you look to the light of true awareness and able to stay in that light uh, and perceive everything differently in that light, then you know this is what the mind training is designed to help you achieve. That's the enlightened state, just, just perceiving differently, perceiving truly. Uh, but it's so radical that we, we struggle with it because it, it, it so turns the, the world upside down, isn't it? Mm. The world seems to be based on sin and guilt and fear and attack, and we, we're so conditioned to thinking that way. Now suddenly we're being asked to look on all of the projections of this thought system, which seem to still be there, and we're asked to change our mind about them and and uh, change our perception of them. Just you know, turn it all around, reverse our thinking and our perception of everything. And, and that is it's, it's fundamentally opposite. It's 180-degree turnaround. And that's why we have a, a course in mind training like this, because it that takes some doing. That's you know that's a process to completely re you know, reverse the ego's thinking and and start perceiving everything differently. It is is a process of training that's going to take years, generally, to accomplish. And that's why it's put together this course because he knows. Okay, you're not going to get this straight away. So you need a systematic, disciplined, mind training pro program to to help you to to uh, reverse the thinking of the world and perceive everything differently. And just one, the first one here is, is, is worth just talking about briefly. The world I perceive holds my fearful self-image in place and guarantees its continuance. That's a, that's a massively important statement. The world I currently perceive holds my fearful self-image in place and guarantees its continuance. The world I now perceive, maybe. In the world I currently perceive is designed to keep your fearful self concept in place. If you fear, then this fearful self image that, that thinks it's a victim of the world and can be punished 
and suffer and die is is perpetuated, isn't it? Every time mm-hmm. you perceive fearfully, then that self-image is is perpetuated. That's what this is saying. So I'll just keep I'll keep doing that until I change my perception. Perception then changes the self-concept, and uh, you're starting to replace the false self-image then with the true self uh, that's beyond it. When you when you change your perception, he's saying this is the only way to do it. Really. Okay. So any other thoughts on that? Above all else, I want to perceive, see differently. Above all else, I want to perceive differently. And uh, God is in everything I see. Perfect love is in everything I perceive. Okay, so you can read... um, Read number 29. God is in everything I see. Behind every image I have made, the truth remains unchanged. And perfect love is in everything I perceive. Behind every image I have made, the truth remains unchanged. Behind every veil I have drawn across the face of love, its light remains undimmed. Behind every veil I have drawn across the face of love, its presence remains undimmed. Beyond all my insane wishes is my will united with the will of my Father. Beyond all my insane wishes is my true awareness united with the pure formless awareness of my source. God is still everywhere and in ev- and in everything forever. Uh, pure. Where are we? Okay, pure, for- pure formless pure. awareness of perfect love. Yeah, there we go. Pure formless awareness of perfect love is still everywhere and in everything forever. And we we who are part of Him will yet look past all appearances and recognize the truth beyond them all. And I, who am part of it, will yet look past all appearances and recognize the truth beyond them all. Uh, I just want to change something quickly. So the face of, remember what we translate as face. Um, Identity. Yeah, well done. It's a good one you, you remembered. Um, across the identity of love. So we are we're veiling our true identity of love. Um, and um, beyond but beyond that, the, the identity remains. It can't it can't really be destroyed. It's just covered over. Which is what this is saying. So, if you want to read it um, from the top in the alternative. Yeah. Oops. I've got back into the split screen again, but I'll blow yeah. it up. Yeah. Just... Yeah, that's fine. Uh, yeah. It's just, it's difficult. Perfect that... love and everything I perceive. The reason I've t- done this is because of the identity of love I've changed. Yeah, yeah. Perfect love is is in everything I perceive. Behind every image I have made, the truth remains unchanged behind every veil. I have drawn across the identity of love. Its presence remains undimmed. Beyond all my insane wishes is my true awareness united with the pure formless awareness of my source. Pure formless awareness of perfect love is still everywhere and in everything forever. And I, who am part of it, will yet look past all appearances and recognize the truth beyond them all. Ah, so what's what's he saying in, in this? 
Well, all the images we have made. And this lesson? Yeah. yeah. Well, all the images we've made, the truth remains unchanged. It's always there, constant. Um, it's our source. It's in everything and everywhere. It's there forever. It all goes way past our appearances. So we want to recognize this truth and go beyond all the images of all the mm. things we perceive. And this, this love is still there, this awareness, this love, perfect love is in everything I perceive. It's still there, although it's been covered over. Because it's our fundamental awareness. And then he points this out in the, in the next one. He makes the connection between perception and our minds. Perfect love is in everything I perceive because perfect love is in my mind. God is in everything I see because God is in my mind. In my own mind, behind all my insane thoughts of separation and attack, is the knowledge that all is one forever. In my awareness, behind all my insane thoughts of separation and attack, is the knowledge that all is one forever. I have not lost the knowledge of who I am because I have forgotten it. I have not lost the knowledge of who, who I really am because I have, I have forgotten it. It has been kept for me in the mind of God, who has not left his thoughts. It has been kept for me in pure formless awareness of perfect love that has not left its extensions. And I who am among them am one of them and one of with, one with him. And I who am among them am one with them and one with it. And from the top. Mm -hmm. Perfect love is in everything I perceive because perfect love is in my mind. In my awareness behind all my insane thoughts of separation and attack is the knowledge that all is born forever. I have not lost the knowledge of who I really am because I have forgotten it. It has been kept for me in the pure formless awareness of perfect love that has not left its extensions and I who am uh, and I who am among them am with them and one with it. Okay. Uh, well in our own awareness okay. yeah <clears throat> um, yes I'm saying in the, in our own awareness our pure awareness uh, behind all the insane thoughts and attack is another knowledge that's completely different. And we haven't actually lost this knowledge. It's there if we just allow it. And it hasn't, it hasn't left any of our extensions either. We are all one together with this, this perfect love of of pure awareness. Yeah. And it's in everything I perceive because it's in my mind. It has to be. It's in my awareness. I made I made um yeah. Changed that already. It's in it's in my awareness. Because perfect love is in my awareness. This this love is in my awareness fundamentally. So it must be in whatever I perceive because I perceive from my awareness. Makes complete sense, doesn't it? The only reason it's there 
is because it's already in my awareness. And perception is not primarily a function of what's outside. The data that's coming in from the so-called external world of illusion is primarily a function of my own awareness. So if perfect love is my foundation, this is my true awareness, then how can I not perceive with perfect love if that's my true And the ego's got no answer to that question, except to try and deny the question, the obliterate the question from our awareness, because because that brings us into the awareness of of God, our true, our true self, our true awareness, and that then becomes the awareness that, that perceives for us, and and uh, uh, because this life, this world is perceptual, that that dictates our life, our perception governs our life, doesn't it? What is your life in this world but your perception of it? So it's a very powerful lesson. It's one I think of quite often during the, the course of the year. God isn't everything I see because God is in my mind. Perfect love isn't everything I perceive because perfect love is in my awareness right now. If it's in my awareness right now, how can I not perceive from that awareness? It's completely logical, isn't it? And the ego doesn't like that kind of logic, so it, it, it tries to make us forget it. But but actually, it's completely logical, common sense. Yeah, this is my true awareness. So how can I, how can I do anything but perceive from this awareness? It's not actually possible to perceive anything outside of this awareness if that's my true awareness. The, the, the impossibility then of the ego's thought system becomes evident. It's actually impossible to perceive without this awareness because there's nothing else but this awareness. This my awareness is my awareness and there's nothing else. And that's all the Course is trying to teach us. There's only one awareness. It hasn't gone away. It's still there. So return your mind to that awareness and just perceive everything from that from that awareness. As he says, it's a very simple course. But the difficulty comes in when we believe we have another awareness. There's another awareness going on in our minds and we believe in that rather than our true awareness, then we have a split mind. Then we have to try and sort out which awareness is true and which is not. Which is that true. I've been suffering which... from, yes, I've had a, yeah, it's a damage of that, haven't I? Uh, well, that, yeah, that, that's <laughs> that's everyone's problem is we don't know who we are so we don't know what our true awareness is and so we must perceive because we perceive from a false awareness oh yeah yeah and we suffer directly. we suffer Do from that one directly. i don't know why we yeah but somehow it's got sometimes very strong hold doesn't it you know with physical pain or something that's you know yeah we just make it worse. <laughs> it's mad. Yeah, it is mad. Absolutely mad. That's that's why you know it's just teaching us. This is all insane. How can you believe that you're something you're not? How is that really possible? Mm, yeah. Whatever comes from that belief would also be impossible and would be insane because it's based on an insane belief that you are something that you're not. So there's no wonder the ego system doesn't work because it's based on an insane, impossible idea, which because of the power of our minds, we've believed in, we've wanted that, and we've made it seemingly real. Perhaps. And so we've created a whole reality based on that. But it remains yeah. impossible and insane. No matter what we think we've done, it's still impossible and insane. Oh, yeah, yeah, That's yeah. a simple truth. Mm -hmm. So true. Still impossible. And, and, you know, that simple truth is then our salvation, is our awakening. Well, it doesn't really matter what projections are going on and what the ego's uh, misperceptions are and the story that it's spinning. It's, it's all impossible and insane. And the Holy Spirit's only judgment is that. Okay, it's impossible and insane. And actually, none of it means anything. That's the one judgment of the Holy Spirit. 
which then keeps you in alignment with the perfect love that is already in your mind and in your awareness that, that recognizes only itself, only perfect love, and uh, discards everything else. All right, so any other thoughts on that? Um, some powerful lessons. The, I think the key themes are, let's just read it through on the top, the five, so you can start to see the connections between them. Yeah. The, the thought system is, is, is related. So one is my attack thoughts or attacking my vulnerability. I'm uh, read my, the rest. Yeah. Mm. Uh, two, above all else, I want to see. Above all else, I want to perceive truly. Above all else, I want to see differently. Above all else, I want to perceive differently. God is in everything I see. Perfect love is in everything I perceive. God is in everything I see because God is in my mind. Perfect love is in everything I perceive because perfect love is in my mind. Now, as you can see how they, you know, they're connected. Um, I'm only at ever attacking my own invulnerability. I'm determined to change my mind to perceive differently um, because perfect love is really in everything I perceive. And that's the case because it's in my mind. It's already in my awareness. So how can I really not perceive with perfect love if, if it's my foundational awareness? Is it possible not to perceive with perfect love if that's my true awareness? The ego tells you that it is. The Holy Spirit says, no, it's not possible. Never has been possible. And the ego's entire idea of its existence is impossible. So forget it and go back to the truth of who you really are. Very, very simple teaching, isn't it? Just applying it in the illusion is, is tricky. Yeah. Because apparently you're facing the impossible uh, projections of this impossible thought system and you face the impossible as your reality every day and then you have to deny it recognizing that it's all impossible and meaningless okay so um shall we do a, a meditation you said you want to stop stop at half past i'm uh, happy to do a Meditation? Yeah, or? Do, yeah, do a meditation. Yeah, that would be fine. Yeah, that would be okay. good. Okay. Do a 20 minute okay. med. Let's finish at yeah. nine. So let's yeah. go for it. That's good. I'll just put it on mute. Okay. So this is a uh, meditation on uh, today's lesson, which is a review lesson. 56, got five previous course lessons to review. So just closing your eyes, sitting comfortably. Your feet shoulder width apart, your back straight, cup your hands in your lap. Close your eyes and... Start off by taking a nice deep breath in through the nose. So you're breathing in, you're noticing how the stomach rises and the chest rises and the subtle flow of air in through the nostrils. You clench the sphincter muscle to lock the energy in. And you draw the energy up your spine into your heart center and draw it up into the crown of your head, pausing at the top of the inhale so it's a a maximal inhale breath. You pause, you scan your mind, just noticing 
thoughts and emotions related body sensations going on. Particularly be aware of any attack thoughts. So are you angry with someone? Are you irritated, even frustrated? These are all forms of attack thoughts. So look at all that and remind yourself as you breathe in that my attack thoughts are attacking my invulnerability. Now how can I know who I am when I perceive myself as under constant attack? And repeat these words after me if you like, say them as affirmations, exhale. Say, how can I know who I am when I perceive myself as under constant attack? Breathing in again, pain, loss, age, and death seem to threaten. Breathe in on this truth and just look at these ideas. Pain, illness, loss, aging, and death. These are an integral part of a human condition. Doesn't matter what we, we, we think we achieve and what we do in our lives, these seem to be pretty much a constant in uh, most human lives. Everyone experiences them at some point. So they seem to be these uh, truths of this world that are very threatening. I mean, you are going to suffer and you are going to die. That's what the ego is telling you. So all my hopes and wishes and plans appear to be at the mercy of a world I cannot control. So breathe in, just say those words. All seems to be out of your control. Yet perfect safety and complete fulfillment are my inheritance. Perfect safety and complete fulfillment are my inheritance. And then again, trying to throw my inheritance away in exchange for the world I perceive. So I've tried to throw my inheritance away in exchange for the world I perceive, but pure form of awareness, perfect love, has kept my inheritance safe for me. Exhale the truth of this. So my own real thoughts will teach me what it is. Sink in to the isness, being beyond attack thoughts, beyond fear, attack and vulnerability. Here's reality, capital reality, just beyond any attack thoughts whatsoever. Above all else, above all else, I want to, to see or perceive truly, above all else, it's quite a step, step breathing in, say it to yourself as you exhale, it's conviction and determination above all else. I want to perceive truly. It's quite a statement saying that this is your commitment, determination above everything else that this world offers and all your other desires, Ooh. expectations, goals, dreams, fears. None of that matters. Above all else, I just want to perceive truly because that means I want to know myself. I can perceive truly from my true self. 
recognizing that what I perceive reflects what I think I am. Breathe in, speak those words as you exhale. Recognizing what I perceive reflects what I think I am. And then again, I realize that true perception is my greatest need. Realize that true perception is my greatest need. Getting in again. So the world I perceive attests to the fearful nature of the self-image I have made. The world I perceive attests to the fearful nature of the self-image I have made. Breathing in and out, and if I want to remember who I am, it is essential that I let this image of myself go. So exhale. I have a sense of just letting go. Well, this false self-image, image of yourself that is fearful, that attacks and feels attacked, that feels like it's a victim, unfairly treated in a cruel world, doomed to suffer and die. This is all the false self-image of the ego, false self-concept. I perceive a test to the fearful nature of the self-image I've made. So if I want to remember who I really am, it is essential that I let this image of myself go. So exhale, just blow it away. Imagine you releasing that self-image. It goes with the thoughts that make it up. So attack thoughts and fear thoughts, guilt anger and frustration and any negative thought just needs to be let go in order to collapse the self-image, be free as it is replaced by truth. True perception will surely be given to me. And with this vision, I will perceive the world and myself as un- Unconditional love. We breathe that unconditional love in. A love without conditions. So love just given free. It doesn't matter what anyone is saying or doing. It doesn't matter how they're behaving. It doesn't matter how you thinking, feeling, behaving. It's given completely free. So remind yourself again that above all else, I want to see or perceive differently. Means I have to change my current perception. Above all else, I want to perceive differently. Breathe that in. Feel the strength of this this statement. Firm determination that you feel. And the world I perceive holds my fearful self image in place. There's the self concept again. And the world just reinforces it, makes it real. It's just caught up in this fearful self image, guarantees its continuance. While I perceive the world as I perceive it now, truth cannot enter my awareness. I invite it in. So I say, I choose to let the door behind this world be open for me so that I may look past it to the world that reflects pure form of someone as perfect love.
I choose to open the door, which is an inner door. Only you can open that door. No one can open it. It has to be opened from the inside. Above all else, eh? above, all, above all else, I want to proceed differently to reaffirm your determination, excel on the truth of that. Feel the conviction of that, the strength in that. Breathe that strength into every pore of your cell, every muscle, your body, every part of your mind, and every fiber of your being. So, <clears throat> Breathing in again, saying, God is in everything I see. Perfect love is in everything I perceive. Behind every image I've made, the truth remains unchanged. Perfect love is in everything I perceive. Find every image I've made, the truth remains unchanged. In the end, behind every veil, I've drawn across the identity of love. Its presence remains undimmed. Beyond all my insane wishes is my true awareness, united with the pure formless awareness of my source. Your yeah, formless awareness of perfect love is still everywhere and in everything forever. And I, who am part of it, will yet look past all appearances and recognize the truth beyond them all. So practice looking past all appearances. Whatever's going on in your life, whatever appearances there are, someone is saying or doing. I recognize the truth beyond all appearances. Breathing in again. Say so perfect love is in everything I perceive. God is in everything I see. Perfect love is in everything I perceive because God is in my mind. Perfect love is in my awareness. So my own awareness. Behind all my insane thoughts of separation and attack, here's the knowledge that all is one forever. I have not lost the knowledge of who I really am. Because I've forgotten it. It has been kept for me. And the pure form of someone is a perfect love. It has not left its extensions. And I, who am among them, am one with them and one with it. Speak those words, say them with conviction, breathe in on those words. It's the fundamental truth. It's talking about 
we are one. So just sinking inwards for a couple of minutes into the perfect love, just perfect oneness, which is pure form of awareness. It underlies all perception. It's in everything I perceive because perfect love is in my mind. My own awareness. Sinking inwards to the pure form of awareness, perfect love. That is your source. So, in everything I perceive, because perfect love is in my in my under awareness. Nowhere else to go, nothing else to do, nothing else to think about, so just breathe, relax. Be still and surrender into this deep awareness, the deep, long, quiet, peaceful stillness. Which perfect love is in everything you perceive because it's in your mind. It's present in your awareness right now. Nowhere else to go and there's nothing else to do and there's nothing else to think of. But to surrender to this awareness. Any thoughts come up, seemingly disturb this awareness, you just look at them. I just thought that above all else, I want to 
perceive differently. That perfect love isn't everything I perceive because perfect love is in my mind right now. So I'm willing to just let go any false perceptions and blow them out. Exhale, blow them away with the breeze of your breath. Nothing that they really are going, going gone. All those stomach into the spine. Spell the last Germania out. And you rest here in this calm, quiet, still, peaceful state of awareness. And just sink inwards for a minute or two of deep silence to experience this pure form of silence, perfect love that underlies all of your misperceptions and all of your false ideas, your false self image. Beyond it all lies just this awareness. Sink into this awareness. Feel it, experience it fully for a minute or two of deep, peaceful silence. So just simply coming back now. This deep connected state into an awareness of the body and the breath, senses in the world. And on the count of three, you're going to open your eyes. So one, breathing in, just noticing how the Stomach rises and the chest rises, a subtle flow of air into your nostrils and pause at the top of the inhale. 
Smile, connect with your breath. Scan the mind, system, thoughts, emotions, related body sensations going on, particularly anything feels negative, limiting, contracted, constricting in the way. Breathing in. Noticing when those thoughts seem to occupy your mind, but remind yourself that above all else, I'm determined to perceive differently. Attack thoughts attacking my own vulnerability. Above all else, I want to perceive differently. Because perfect love is in everything I perceive. That's the case because perfect love is in my mind, in my awareness. Breathe it in to every pore, the resolve, the muscle of your body, every part of your mind, every fiber of your being is in this perfect loving awareness. Infusing every cell of your body. And when you exhale, and you let it go, release, blowing it all out. The breeze of your breath to nothingness that it really is. It's going, going, gone. All those stomach into the spine, expel the last remaining air out. And then you just rest here. On the exhale and still some peace. Think of the state of true perception based on pure forms towards perfect love into your awareness. Set the intention to stay here for the rest of the Evening and on into your week ahead. So it is said. And so it is done. Well, on the count of three, you're going to open your eyes. And just taking a minute to look around, observing various objects in the room surrounding you. With this true perception, notice that this awareness isn't everything you see because it's in your mind, it's in your awareness. Whether your eyes are closed or open, try closing your eyes. Open your eyes, whatever you look at, look at some other object, it's the same awareness because it's in your mind. So it's in everything you perceive because it's in your mind. If you can totally understand that, to experientially understand that then you've looked, really started to understand this lesson. And this will transform all of your perceptions because you'll be perceiving from your true awareness rather than acting outside in, reacting to the insane projections of the ego. You stay rooted in your true awareness and you perceive everything from that awareness, which is that's really peaceful and loving and kind, gentle and helpful, generous and patient and so on. All the higher qualities and values come from this awareness. So just rest in this awareness. You can use um, any of today's lessons to top up that awareness if you need to for the rest of the evening to uh, remind you of who you really are and what your true perception is. And... Uh, Carry that with you into bed and um, your day, your week ahead. So that uh, brings us to the end of the session, end of the meditation and of tonight's session.
Okay, so thanks, Elaine. I Yeah, will, thank you. you know, see you. Um, you gonna join tomorrow? Uh, can we do tomorrow lunchtime? One o'clock. Uh, maybe it might be a little bit later. Yeah, it should be okay. Thereabouts. One one thirty ish. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I've Yeah, got that's work perfect. tomorrow. I've got a meeting at twelve thirty, which might run on Oh, okay. Yeah. a Oh, little okay bit. then. So. We should make it one thirty. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Thanks, Okay. Elaine. Good night, Jono. Namaste. Namaste. Okay. So uh, that's a wrap for tonight. Thank you to Elaine for joining. As always, making the session possible. If you enjoyed the call and you enjoyed the um, session, then uh, do uh, join us in uh, one of these live sessions. You can go to theaolg.com to do that. Um, you can also get the daily quote that I shared up front in the email along with the uh, mind training lesson from A Course in Miracles and uh, some breast break recordings, short reminders basically of the lesson. Sent to you every day via Telegram. So go to uh, lifebold.com. You can see that uh, spelling in the uh, top right corner of the banner in the background or as a text box. That and, and do your thing. And finally, you can subscribe to the channel. So just uh, join us. Join us on the journey whenever I go live. You'll be notified by YouTube and uh, you can watch the live stream or the recording. So I hope you'll do one of those things and perhaps to meet you on the inside soon. Thanks for watching or listening and uh, namaste. This means the uh, true self in me which perceives truly acknowledged and honors that same true self, which is behind all true perception in you. Much love, peace, and joy in that self.